Well, hello everyone. It's Christine Marie Mason, your host for the Rose Woman Podcast. It's a special New Year's episode, and I'd like to start by taking you through a visualization of our single beautiful planet all the way around Earth. In every civilization, the new year is marked with celebration. In the Gregorian calendar, it's the 31st of December and the 1st of January, which is now pretty much in every country in the world demarcated. Some countries also have Lunar New Year's and Eastern Christian New Year, which is Epiphany. But I want you to imagine the very first country, Tonga, rolling into the new year and then travel around the world with me. The 1st of January arrives in Eastern Australia and the Solomon Islands, and then in Japan and Korea and Ulaanbaatar, and then Siberia and Hong Kong and Sumatra, Vietnam, Christmas Island. Then it's New Year's Day in Bhutan and Kazakhstan and the Maldives and Uzbekistan and then Armenia and Oman and the United Arab Emirates. And we keep going westward. Then it's Djibouti and Kenya and Africa and then Botswana, Burundi, and Zimbabwe. We're in Europe now, Italy, France, Norway, Portugal, England, Scotland. It's dawning in Greenland. It's dawning in Brazil, the new day, and then Newfoundland and Argentina and Eastern Canada, New York, D.C., Boston. It's it's midnight and turning the first of the year in the Carolinas and then in the great city of Chicago, and then in the Arizona deserts and the Dakotas, and then Colorado and Chihuahua in Mexico, and then you get New Year's Eve in the great state of California and Oregon, then in Baja, California, and French Polynesia, then in Alaska, Hawaii, the Cook Islands in New Zealand, and the last habited country, Samoa, to celebrate our turning into a new beginning. I learned a fun fact in researching this, and that is that the international dateline time zone, the very last day of a day anywhere on Earth, is literally called anywhere on Earth. And if you want to say that, you know, we have to close this document or sign this thing by December 31st, you would, and you didn't have a time zone specified, you would say December 31st, anywhere on Earth or AOE. So why is it? that New Year's is celebrated all over the world. How is it that something in human existence wants us to demarcate this crossing? I write in my book, Reverence, how rituals are vital to our human experience and have been since the beginning of recorded time, that rituals invite a moment of timelessness, of magic, of wonder and mystery. They demarcate rites of passage and momentous occasions. They help us celebrate and heal. They help us remember who we are by placing us in the larger network of existence, in time and space, and in nature. Rituals can direct our attention and help us make clear choices and move forward in our lives. And when conducted with others, they are magnified by being witnessed in community. On the new year, as we move into new year rituals, I have some ideas for you on making the new year practices more coherent. You know, for many years I've been doing this practice of uh, sort of visioning into the new year. And I have a lot of things that I draw on in, in that work. It's usually a two or three day retreat that I do with a bunch of friends and clients. And One of the things we do in the very beginning is to review the past year. And in the modern age, that's pretty easy to do. If you just go through your iPhone photographs, like sort of get a scan of what you've taken pictures of or glance back at your calendar and and make notes of where you were and what happened. And as that is is processing, you know, you're going to come up with memories and energetics. So we take notes as we review the prior year. We take notes on a couple of things. One is for anything that is undigested from from the closing year. So were there things that happened in the past year that are still sort of stuck in your system? 
things that happened with other people, unresolved concerns, emotional upset or contraction that you've been holding. And we really want to spend some time evaluating those and attempting to come current. One principle is that what you don't bring into your consciousness, what you don't integrate from your experiences, what you don't digest and come to completion with will repeat, will be carried forward into the new year. And in fact, prior experiences that are undigested can clog your perception of reality. Uh, Thomas calls it that traumas or undigested experiences create a reality distortion field. And it's really difficult to invite a clean beginning or the new vision to come to you without clearing out what's stuck. So we want to take notes on things that are still stuck uh, as we're going through our year in review. And then the next set of reflections is, how have I been changed by this year? What have I learned from my activities, my relationships, my inner inquiry? How have I grown? That's a pretty good long one for me in this past year. So many lessons, so many expansion points. I think I'm finally done with some patterns that have repeated recurrently throughout my life. Pretty proud of that. Did some things wrong and made some mistakes and wanted to note some of those things also. So we've noted what's stuck in us and we've noticed how we've changed and grown. Might have given ourselves some memories of joy and play and reminders of what we've accomplished. And with that sort of in mind, what still needs to be digested, uh, what we've accomplished, what we've learned, then we go into an invitation to clear seeing. So here are another group of questions that might be helpful. In our review, in our life wheel review, when we do this practice, the first question we ask in the clear seeing is, what is nourishing, nurturing, or feeding you? What is feeling great in your life right now? And then you write down as fast as you can, impulse on impulse, the first hit, what is nourishing, nurturing, or feeding you? Another question might be, what are you a full yes to in your life right now? Where are you lit up? What's making you joyful? I think here you can also ask not just what you're doing in your life that you're a full yes to, but you can also turn it into a being question, like what qualities of being are you a full yes to? What qualities of, are, of being and, and where in your life do you feel wonderful? Where in your life are there qualities of being that you might want to invite in more? So for me, I noticed that I had a lot of joy when I was playing and that the quality of being where I got like really contracted and serious wasn't very fun for me. And I wanted to invite a deeper expression of the quality in me that was playful. Then after we go through the nourishing, nurturing, and feeding question or the qualities of being that we're enjoying, now we do a visualization that gets to what wants to be born through us. So I have a belief that our future self is already hanging out there in time space, that we're on our path, that we kind of know it, and that our future self is pulling at us. So in this next phase of the meditation, we investigate, we imagine our future self, and we feel that future self. And then we ask our question, what future is pulling me toward it? And this begins in most people to get at the question of what is being called in, what is attracting us, what are you attracted to? It kind of gets you into a place of acknowledging that you already are being attracted to your future, that you somehow deep inside of yourself know where you're going, even if you have a lot of resistance to it. So now we've done what's nurturing us, we've done what qualities of being do we want to cultivate, and now we're, and we've done this visualization on what future is calling us. And then we do a set of questions on what our instinctual wisdom, our inner knowing says we might want to cut. The first question there is energy drains. So what are your energy drains in your life? And you just start writing. You consider the projects you're doing, the beliefs you're holding, the people in your life, and where your energy is being sucked out. 
we can generally stay on that one quite a while. There are some signs of an energy drain that might be helpful to look at. Like if you're yawning, if you're bored, if you don't want to do it, these are all signs of a, an energy drain. Then we ask the question of what's really not working in my life? What, what kind of distractions do I have? What kind of deep patterns do I have that I'm really bored of in myself? And what do I need to release or deal with? And again, I want you to go with the first hit as you're doing these. And we're still in the release category here. So we talk now about where of our actions or ingrained behaviors not caught up with our wisdom. So I, I hope you like that idea that you already have a lot of knowledge. I mean, how many of us know exactly how to do our practices, know exactly what foods are good for us, what supplements we need, what kind of rituals we need in our daily life, and then we inconsistently act on them. And so I, I know you have the wisdom, and are there any places where my actions or habits or ingrained behaviors on the day-to-day have not yet caught up with my wisdom, and what patterns am I complicit in that I'd like to release? So again, first hit, go, write those down. And then I want to look at myself a little bit more deeply, like the qualities that that I have that are annoying to other people. Like maybe I want to release my judgmentalism and maybe I want to release my fear because it wears on me and on others. Um, That's a pretty standard one, by the way. How do we trust life more and release our fear? And again, we go through that with our first hit in mind. So we've completed this sort of inventory of ourself and where we're at. So when I lead the practical visioning course, one thing that I notice particularly in America is that we often confuse our life with what we do and our goals are often about doing and not being. And so I like to start the class off with precepts that frame the way that I think about setting goals and growing in our fullness of life and creating more freedom, more choice, uh, more healing, more wholeness. And the first one is, I believe that life exists as you, that the life force that is in you, through you, and around you exists in as and as you, and it exists even without you participating that our bodies are channels of universal energy and that everything that we're seeing uh, filtered through our unique individual perspective is valuable and that we learn as we go through our lives how to become a more directed and more clear channel. Even if we get a lot of skills in making things or doing things or we grow companies or we grow children, that it's not originating from us. It's still not originating from us that it, we didn't make ourselves and we aren't going to decide when we die. And our life is given to us through our breath and the food we eat. And we're totally dependent on this planet. And so, you know, when I, when I think about the, the, that it's life living through me, it really takes both the pressure off and to, to like be a thing that makes things to be a unit of productivity And it allows me instead to tap into the giant well of energy and possibility that I feel surrounding all of us all of the time. And then continuing sort of on that thing, the second precept of my approach to visioning is that making and doing comes out of this creative pulse. That making and doing comes from the creative pulse inherent in all things. That creativity is our inheritance. That is when we're most like the great creative force that makes all things. It's our spiritual inheritance. It's our genetic and mimetic inheritance. That when we're participating actively in our impulse conversion to an idea, that means when we have a creative idea and we actively take it from the mind, through the hands, through the mouth, through the body, that we're, we direct energy into it and that we focus that energy in, into manifestation, into becoming material reality, And then also the things that we decide not to work on, the things that we decide to release, that we let decay, that we destroy, that 
All of those choices are in line with the natural cycle of the whole world that our making and our releasing, our creating and our releasing is something that all humans have known that lives in our epigene, that lives in our genetic knowledge, and that it is part of our full engagement in living with the human body. So that life is existing as us and that making and doing comes from this life energy, comes from the creative pulse that is inherent in our being. And then the further step on that is that we have the power to direct our attention. So all of you who know me know that I've been practicing yoga for a very long time and that the second yoga sutra talks about yogas chitti vritti narodaha and in the common translation that is calming the fluctuations of the mind but that's not the actual Sanskrit translation. The Sanskrit translation is when we practice we learn to direct our mind and focus our attention in the place we want it to go. So now we become aware of the power of our attention and our intention to bring the creative things that we were just mentioning into reality. And when you notice that the direction of your intention and attention is such a force and that your dilution of attention, your distractibility, the things that take you out of your intention and clarity, uh, that those need to be let go to get you the kind of focus that you want to really have a clean and clear life. And that this intention is something like we, we sit down and say, I'm calling in what I want to do, that we're essentially tuning and directing that life energy. We, we open ports and we close ports and we turn towards what wants to be born next and away from what we're bored with and away from what is no longer serving the planet. We're not controlling life, which is an impossibility. I will tell you, I tried that for many years, didn't work out very well but we do direct our attention. We put ourselves in the path of where we wanna go. And then what appears often is serendipity or grace, and it might arise because we're paying attention to that area of life. We will see what we need to see, and we will be able to act accordingly when we know what we're looking for and when we're in that field. This, this last year, I've really been um, doing what's called a synchronicity journal, by the way, which is I take note of all the times throughout the year where I have a, a thought about needing something and the very next moment it appears someone mentions that randomly. Or three days in a row, I meet someone from Louisville, Kentucky. And I have never thought about Louisville, Kentucky before, but now I'm noticing, oh, that's interesting. It's coming up and over and over. Maybe there's something there for me to pay attention to, that I'm making some meaning about what might appear to be unrelated coincidences or mentions of something and making myself more alert to what synchronicity or the unconscious might be trying to communicate with me. Okay, that was a little digression. Well, I, I will I will also like to point out that depending on your family system and you know you grew up in and how much pressure there was to accomplish something or how much value there was to doing or accomplishing that there's probably an embedded idea about where your actions and creativity originate from like some people think that ideas come from their brain and some people think that ideas come from context or they come from being prepared and insight. And some people think that ideas are pulled down from a collective consciousness or are divinely inspired. Others think that ideas have lives of their own, that they're floating out there in time space and are seeking a human partner to make them real. So where do you think ideas come from? What makes the light bulb go off? Is it coming through you or is it coming from you? Or is it arising in the field between you and other people? So just giving that a little bit of thought, because if you've been brought up to think that like, oh, you made this thing, you're so great, or you're so smart, you're so great, or you got this great promotion, you're so great, and you've started to identify with yourself as the doer, then it, it can kind of go two ways. One is that you feel a tremendous amount of pressure to keep doing and make it better and better and better. And the other way is that you re you resent the pressure and you don't do anything near what would bring you the most joy in your life. That kind of flows me into another precept is that doing really isn't required at all because you know our society overall is incredibly focused on activism and doing stuff. And a lot of the doing comes out of a sense of having to prove something or out of a sense of obligation. And if you're an American person listening to this, and also thank you to the people in the 99 other countries who are listening, you guys are great. 
but if you're in a in a country that has a lot of Calvinistic systems that say you're only valuable because of what you make and what you do, that you can earn your way to heaven somehow, a lot of those ideas infiltrate our approach to how we make our plans, how we do our visions, how we do things in the world. So my orientation in goal setting in the new year is that you don't work to be worthy or to be valuable or to be seen, that you're fully worthy just as you are and that your core self is completely loved and cannot ever be improved upon, that the evolution of our making and working and creating goes from a sense of obligation that I've got to prove myself and I have all this ambition to being that I am making out of unfettered freedom and joy. I am making out of true delight and that my action then arises from freedom. So my hope for everyone is that we have an orientation of complete freedom, that we have choice over the things we're doing, and that if we choose to do nothing at all, and of course take the consequences of that, that's also just fine. If we want to sit in peace and sit on the beach and do nothing else, that's totally fine. There's no requirement. So if you are a person who is choosing to be in the world and act, then why not choose to act from your full creative abundance? Why not take the time to focus and bring your energy into and send it into one specific focus? My old friend Dev Patik used to call this the law of focus, time, and attention. So during the review that we're doing of the year, we want to see where we're acting out of obligation and constraint and invite a change in those in those areas so that we can act from choice and freedom. You know, there are some places where we're still compelled, some places in our lives where we're not really free yet. We act out of habit. But that aside, we are in freedom to do or not do as we please. Right action arises from freedom of choice. Is it coming out of a natural joy and wonder or is it coming with anxiety? Is my choice of what to do coming with a pressure to perform? So again, it's my sincere hope for everybody that the pressure goes away as you're creating your plan and that you're just allowing things to move through you in a more unfettered way where you're excited about what wants to be born through you. So like I said about sitting on the beach, choosing spaciousness for many of us is an important part of setting our plan. That you're under no obligation to do anything and that the more you are stripping away the stuff in your life that you're sort of a meh to, that you're a medium to, not really a full yes for, the more you can bring your attentions to bear on the things that are vital and in alignment with your dharma, the more joy you're going to find in your life. So here's a blessing for that work. I am an open channel. I am awake to new ideas. I discern what is important to do. I discern what is mine to do. I call in allies and resources. My yes is strong. My no is graceful. I stand in my center. The path forward is often clear. And when it's not clear, I have faith. I am awake to synchronicities, surprises, and gifts along the way. All right. Well, you know uh, me. I'm always, I've always got multiple projects going. And people have asked me in the past, how do you get so much done? How do you get so much accomplished and, and still seem so happy and not stressed? And I will share with you a couple of additional principles that have really served me well over the last 30 years and really developed over 30 years. The first one is from a Kabbalah teaching about being an open pipe, that we aim to be open, giving and receiving in equal measure, that we want life energy to come through us and flow through us, and that if we're closed at the top and not able to receive, we will become depleted. And if we're closed at the bottom and not able to give, we will fill up so much that we implode and explode. That principle is pretty clear. So it, it really feeds into this idea of how might you self-nurture. Another principle that I work with is that there are sort of three frequencies that are going on in any at any given time. Like there's the frequency of like the short term, this week, next week, daily habits that support the projects that I'm working on, like goals 
of, of waves. And then there are sort of midterm projects, like things I want to do in the next couple of years that I'm working on. And then I'm always aware of a deeper, long wave, like the body of my life's work. Like, how is it building? How is it interrelating? Um, I heard someone say once that we always overestimate what we can do in a year, but we underestimate what we can do in a lifetime. And, you know, you see people like one of my sons is a visual artist. He's a very talented visual artist. And he finally decided to quit his day job and really just work on his portfolio. And then he had his first one man show about six months later. And it was really exciting and he sold some work, but he was sort of disappointed at the economics of the situation, how hard he had worked to develop this and and grew frustrated about continuing on that path. And I, I said to him, you know, it takes time. And, and I will tell you that I know now, this is my eighth venture, I'm in my eighth venture now. And every project takes three to five years to get stable, to get consistent, to be known, to have a culture. And and that around year five, um, you often have a, a choice in as to whether or not to continue that or start up something new or bring new energy into the thing that you're working on. And it's no different if you're going to be an artist or a musician. So if you're beginning on a mid-arc or a long-arc body of work, have faith and just know that it builds over time. And, and that if you take your time and your attention and your intention and you call in the resources you need, that there is no reason it can't be you that has that deep success. Be curious and keep at it. So another thing that I will say is I teach this life wheel in the Practical Visioning course. And at the very center of my wheel, the most important thing is the stability center, that the very core of that is the well of spirit. And in that well is my infinite receptivity to my breath, to the things that are nourishing me and nurturing me in my life, to the acknowledgement that I am part of a much bigger field of existence, to God or goddess or quantum field, whatever you want to call it, and that my practice is every day to connect to the well of spirit and remember who I am and where I came from, that I am not a thing, but a process in the mind of creation, that I come through my lineage and I will be continuing on in life through the lineage of my descendants, that I influence everyone I touch and that I'm part of this web. And so if I can stay connected with the well of spirit on the daily basis. It's like the source from which all of my energy comes. And then the next thing in the ring of stability is my personal health. Ladies and gentlemen, that thing where you eat really good food and you don't get addicted to things that are bad for you and you move your body and you stretch and you get strong and you hike up and down and you breathe the air and you go out into nature, that whatever it is that you do to not be on uh, chronic medications and illnesses, that there are so many resources out there to bring you into your healthiest and most beautiful state, that if you have your spirit steady and you have your health steady, you can get those two things into alignment, you are like 50% of the way to an amazing and wonderful life. And then, then I have a ring, like a, another ring, and that ring is gets ever more practical. And that ring has money, home, and community. And that you know you gotta get if you're getting right with your personal finances, whatever they are, getting right in your home, like a stable home, whatever that means to you. Uh, that could be as little as a laptop and a backpack and your little ritual travel altar, and it could be as much as a, a clean and steady home where you feel safe in your base. And then community that you have friends and people that you can lean into. So now you've got your well of spirit, your ring of health, and this ring of stability. When those things are in alignment, you know, there's not super deep conflict in your home. You can approach things with peace. When that, when that's in alignment, then any projects that you uh, put on your spokes, you know, will roll around so easily because they're emanating from this stable base. And it's very hard to do a huge new initiative when you're in a bad marriage or your finances are messed up or you're really sick 
or you can't connect to God and you think it's all coming from you, then this anxiety arises. So I would I would look at in these areas, what can I do to bring more peace, more joy, more centeredness? And that might be all you do. You could spend your whole year just sort of solidifying your well of spirit or your whole year solidifying your health and not even do anything else because if those things are out of balance, then it's hard to get a lot of other things dialed in. In the full course, we then go into looking at the things that do want to be born through us, our current projects, our current initiatives, deciding what to sunset, deciding what to amplify, deciding what to bring in and invite into our lives, like what do we want to create next? And then we go through some principles. I think I'll share these with you actually. Uh, and, And one is that after many decades of doing this, I have identified what the top blockers are that stop people from getting their projects done or accomplishing their goals. And the first the first blocker is what I was just talking about, that if something in the inner wheel, this spirit or health or stability, if that's not attended to or unbalanced, then like a neglected child or a pet that hasn't been taken out, those things will poke at you and get your attention in any way possible so that you will address them because they're the most vital things in your life. So, you know, if you're going gung-ho on a work project, but your health is failing, or you're going gung-ho on a work project, but your marriage is failing, then those things will scream at you until they're dealt with. And it really gets in the way of your success. And then the second top blocker are unhelpful and unconscious beliefs and patterns. Because sometimes deeper core wounds and core beliefs interfere with our cognitive intention. They they just create a sort of boomerang pattern in your life. I had an amazing moment once listening to a lecture on the impact of childhood trauma on health. And you know, people have things that repeat in their health, weight patterns, um, the kinds of sicknesses, flus, whatever. So they're very draining and distracting, but that recurring patterns in general continue to be limiting. And so you want to look at places in your life where you know you, you might have a belief that you're not enough or that you're afraid to stand up in front of other people and really step into your power. So that's why you go you, when you go back to the initial circle, you do the spiritual work in your life. You identify drains in your core spirit or in your core belief spheres, and they become the number one thing you work on. So if that boomerang of repeat patterns is happening, that that really does go to the top of the list to free you up for later and more magnificent work. A couple of other things are seeking permission from other people to do what you want to do or seeking validation along the way. Um, many, many people who grew up in families are had an early experience of being judged and found lacking have been entrained to seeking validation from others and they're looking outside of themselves for validation. If the fire comes from inside you and, and you dive into it and you have your own reference point, like that's a that's a very different feeling than having the fire and looking out to other people to validate it. A lot of self-doubt can creep in here too, like do I have the credentials? Are people going to believe me? Am I credible in this area? You know, you want people to let you know that you can do it. And I would say just don't even do that. You can seek help and seek assistance, which comes in the resourcing section of the visioning program. But this sort of, I need someone else to validate the fact that I'm able to go after my dreams does get in the way of a lot of people moving ahead. Encouragement is one thing. Validation is a whole other level of that. The other one that's a really big blocker from getting projects done is just too many things on the plate. And we do a whole exercise in planning our timelines for the things we want to get accomplished, planning forward and backwards and anticipating response times from others and you know, overestimating the amount of time available to you to do things or underestimating the sequential time that's required to do things. And 
it takes a tremendous amount of energy or effort to make things successful. And diffusion of attention and intention really puts things off. It delays them for a long time. Okay, I'll give you one more blocker in the, the things that get in the way. And that is that we do have a missing skill. And I don't think having a missing skill is a reason to believe that you can't go after the vision. It just means it's a place where you have to get support and help. But in this area, what you're doing is you're saying, this is the vision and here are the pieces I don't know how to do and where I'm going to fill in with other people and get the resources and the team or the associates or my personal board of directors to help fill in that gap because I really want to see this thing made manifest in my life. I might get a teacher in that area also and bring those skills into my own personal um, my own personal domain. I will add, okay, there's one other thing. And number seven, which is like a lack of conviction. Sometimes, like I've had learned to play guitar on my list for like 30 years, pretty much. Like, And it just never happened. I got like 10 chords, don't have the physical agility with the fingers, wasn't that committed, but it still goes on my list. And that's just kind of a ridiculous thing at this point because I don't have the conviction or the intention behind it. And so if you're carrying ideas of who you should be or what things you want to get done in your life forward and they're no longer fresh and they lack conviction, then it just like creates this loop of I said I'm going to do it and I didn't do it and I'm a failure. Instead, attune to yourself and like feel into what you really want to birth and you really want to bring into your life and know it and like see it in your mind and and watch that blossom and drop off the things that are an energy drain, a distraction that you're met about, you really don't want to do anymore, you fell into, you're doing out of obligation. Let those things go. Let them go with grace. Let them go with kindness and and invite in the fullest and deepest expression of yourself. You might need a roadmap to financially navigate or to relationally navigate from where you are now to the next place. You might go through a liminal time where you're very confused, but I have the faith that when you clear your mind about what you want, you commit to getting the resources and the insights, you align with spirit and synchronicity, and you're out there listening for what wants to be born through you, that your deepest vision and dharma will manifest. The seed of what you are, who you are, and what you're here to do will be born. If that seed aligns with something that the world really needs, that's even better. Like what the world needs right now, what they're responding to, what creates value for people, that that even like magnifies more the energetics that will support you in creating a most, most, most beautiful, beautiful life. So that was a lot. Um, I have a big list myself uh, and I'm currently working on culling that list. So we want to strengthen and refine in our core areas, in our spiritual health and wealth, in our physical health and wealth, in our in our home, family, community, in our core relationships. We want to refine and focus our projects and activities, and we want to become more free and peaceful and joyful and impactful and enjoy this life that we've been given. So whether you're in Tonga, or you're in Samoa, or you're in Florida, Montana, or anywhere on planet Earth, I want you to carve some time out to participate in this human ritual of evaluating and closing out a period in your life. Invite in energetic closure, debt forgiveness, forgiveness, say the things you need to say, visit your neighbors, do all of the things that humans do maybe not blow off some fireworks because, you know, climate change, mark it with a dance, with an embrace, with a kiss, and embrace and open your arms and your heart into the possibility of a clean beginning. So to all my English-speaking friends, Happy New Year, and to my German friends, Guten Rutsch in Neues Jahr, and wherever you're at, may your life be filled with clean beginnings and great joy in the coming days. If you want to connect with me, I'm at the.rose.woman on Instagram 
or you can connect with my company, rosebudwoman at rosewoman.com, where we make beautiful body care and intimate care products that are guaranteed to support you in your health and well-being. And you can also find two of my books, uh, The Nine Gifts, which is First Aid for Mind, Body, and Spirit, and Reverence, A Guide to Rituals and Meaning in Modern Life at the rosewoman.com site.